Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where today we're embarking on a virtual polar expedition with our friends at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. Today, we're going to have the opportunity to test our knowledge on all things Arctic and Antarctic, learn about the animals that brave the conditions at the poles, and create some Arctic art. Now, in the spirit of that Arctic art, if you'd like to craft along with us today, you'll want to have a few materials. You'll want to have both colored construction paper as well as white construction paper. You'll want to have markers and or paint, a hole punch, a ribbon, glue, and scissors. Though, like the polar animals we'll be learning about today, you can adapt the activity with just paper and something to write with, so markers or pencils. We're also going to have the chance to test our knowledge a little bit. So our friend Audrey here is going to have some questions for us, and you'll probably have questions for her as well. Feel free to use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen to both ask and answer questions throughout the lesson. If we don't get to your questions right away, not to worry, we're gonna save a few minutes at the close of the lesson specifically for Q&A. You'll also wanna be sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're gonna have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie, possibly with your art project if you're crafting along with us. And if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Wonders of Wildlife, you'll be entered to win a one month membership to the after school club of your choice. We'll talk a little bit more about that prize when we get to the end of the lesson, but for now, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things off to your instructor for today, lead educator at Wonders of Wildlife, Audrey Moore. Hello, everyone. So just like Kaylee said, my name is Audrey Moore and I am an education lead here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. So before we get started, I did wanna kick off the class by asking you where you all are from. So if you wanna type in the chat box and let me know where you're from, I would love to see where you guys are joining us from. Could be here in the US, could be anywhere else. So I'd love to see where you guys are joining us from. Awesome, so I'm seeing some Kentucky, New York, California, Arizona, Missouri, that's where we're at right here at Wonders of Wildlife. Awesome, awesome. Well, no matter where you are joining us from, I am very happy that you are here and I'm so excited to talk about some Arctic and Antarctic animals and environments with you. So before we get started, um, I did wanna give you a brief introduction to this Wonders of Wildlife place that I keep talking about. So if you're not familiar, um, you can look at the slide here and see all of these amazing pictures of our facility. So Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium is a completely immersive experience into the environments of the world. From ocean to land, there are over 1.5 miles of exhibits to see, and we have over 800 different species to share with you. Today, we will be focusing on a series of exhibits that we showcase um, some of the coldest places on our planet Earth. We will also talk all about the animals that inhabit these chilly areas, and you will get to see our exhibits a little bit later on in the class as well. So I'll give you a little sneak peek. Before we get too much further, I also wanted to clue you in and let you know, just like Haley said, that if you want to um, go through as we're testing your knowledge of these areas and asking a lot of questions along the way, you're more than welcome to guess the answer to yourself or say it out loud. If you wanna do kind of a game show quiz with your family, or you can also answer in the chat box if you want to do that as well. It's totally up to you. So without any other introduction stuff, let's go ahead and begin our expedition to the Arctic and the Antarctic. So my first question of the day is, are the Arctic and the Antarctic the same place? Yes or no? So do you think that these are the same area? Are they similar? Are they different? Yes or no? So if you answer no, you are correct. Now, if that was not the answer that you chose and you said let's, yes, then let's look at why you might think that some of these places are the same. So on this slide, don't you think that these pictures look pretty similar? I, I think that they do. There's some water, some ice. They both look really, really cold. So how do we know the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic? 
let's think of some different ways that we can find the difference between these two areas. I have an idea. We can look at where they're located on planet Earth. So where do you think that you could find the Arctic and the Antarctic regions on the globe? Could be one and two, three and four, maybe one and three, one and four. Could be really anywhere, right? But where do you think that they're located? So if you guessed C, one and three, then you are correct. So if you were to take the globe and you were to look at it from the very top, the top is going to be the Arctic and the bottom is going to be the Antarctic. And on those areas, we might also know them as the North and the South Pole. So anything over 75 degrees longitude, so the lines that run this way on the Earth, they are going to show us where different things are positioned on the Earth. But then with, sorry, longitude is this way, latitude is this way, longitude, anything above the longitude line of 75 degrees here, or down below is going to be the Arctic or the Antarctic. So we also know that the Earth rotates on its axis, right? So it rolls kind of like this on its axis. So what we see is that these areas don't get as much sunlight as places closest to the equator. So even here in Missouri, we still get a decent amount of sunlight because we have a normal day and a normal night. At the poles, the temperatures drop so, so cold because of the limited amount of sunlight that they have. So did you know that the poles actually have five months of daylight? Then they have one month that is day and night. And then they'd go through another cycle of five months of complete darkness. And then another month where they have a day and a night. And then back to five months of daylight and so on and so forth. So their days are kind of wonky and it's really cold because of the way that the earth rotates on its axis, as well as how the sun hits the earth when the earth is rotating or orbiting around the sun. So do you think that maybe another difference, I just talked about how cold these places are because of the sun. Do you think another difference could be temperature? Is maybe one colder than the other on average? Remember that an average is going to be something that is kind of the middle ground. So if you were to add all of the temperatures of these areas up for an entire year and divide it by 365 days, it'd be kind of like the middle temperature or what temperature they see the most. So both of these areas are very, very cold and both would be a good answer. And it's kind of true because they both are very, very cold. However, the Arctic is actually the coldest of the two areas on average. So the Arctic has about 32 degrees in the summer as an average, which I will remind you that 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point for fresh water. So it's still very, very chilly. And it's about negative 40 degrees in the winter. Now the Antarctic on the other hand, remember the colder of the two, averages negative 18 degrees in the summer and set negative 76 in the winter. And remember, those are just averages, so they can be colder or warmer depending on the day. So you could get colder than negative 76 degrees in the Antarctic, which would be really, really cold. Awesome, so we know that both of these areas are really cold as we just discussed, but maybe there's a difference between the type of land that these areas have. So let's answer this. The Arctic and the Antarctic are their own continents. True or false? So the Arctic and the Antarctic are their own pieces of land. True or false? Well, the answer is false, but there's a little bit more to it. Now, it is sort of true, but only one of these areas is their own continent. So what is a continent? A continent is a main continuous expanse of land, which is big fancy words for a big old piece of land. And in our entire world, we have seven continents. Do you think that maybe we could name the seven continents out loud? Let's name them. We have North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. 
So as you can see, the Antarctic is its own continent of land. Now the ant, or sorry, the Arctic on the other hand is made up of several different continents, including North America, Europe, and Asia. And it includes countries like Canada, Norway, Finland, Russia, and even the United States. Now, from these continents, you'll notice that since Antarctica is its own big piece of land, and the Arctic is kind of a hodgepodge of all these other different continents, what might connect those hodgepodge of different continents together? Big floating sheets of ice. That's what connects them. So the Arctic is actually made up of a lot more floating ice than really anything else. So you'll see lots of icebergs down there that have kind of broken off other pieces of the continent, and that helps kind of make up the landscape down there as well. So the Arctic is not completely, but there's a lot of kind of free floating ice, whereas the Antarctic does have some free floating ice, but it's more considered that big chunk of land on the southern part of our Earth or our planet. Awesome. So I think that another difference could be the people that live in these areas. Well, actually, do people even live here? Let's answer this next question. People cannot live in the Arctic or the Antarctic because it's too cold. True or false? I know I definitely couldn't live in the Arctic or the Antarctic because I do not like being chilly. 68 degrees in my office is a little bit too chilly for me. So I definitely couldn't stand negative 76 degrees, but do you think other people can? Yeah, definitely other people can. So this answer is false. In the Arctic, people do inhabit the countries that are in this area even today. There's a population of about 4 million people that live here, actually. And there are more than 40 groups of indigenous peoples that have lived in the Arctic for a really long time. Antarctica, on the other hand, doesn't really have a permanent human population. Imagine spending all year in those challenging temperatures. I could not. Um, but besides tourists, Antarctica's main residents are researchers with up to 4,000 people moving into various science research stations during the summer periods. That's a lot of people in negative 76 degree weather. I don't think so. Awesome. So I think that we've learned enough about the area and the land of the Arctic. But besides people, what else do you think might live here? Yeah, you're right, animals. One of my favorite things. Did you know that there are animals in the Arctic that don't live in the Antarctic or vice versa? There's animals in the Antarctic that don't live in the Arctic. Well, let's answer some more questions to see what animals might live in the Arctic, the Antarctic, or even both. Awesome, so our first question is about my friend, the polar bear. And where do you think the polar bear lives? And I have a cool artifact here for you. So this is a polar bear skull. Can you guys see that? A polar bear skull. It's a lot bigger than my head um, because they have very, they are very, very big bears. So where do you think that they live? If you guess the Arctic, you would be correct. So polar bears are the largest bear in the world and they are the top predator of the Arctic. They can swim around six miles an hour and run up to 25 miles an hour. They have really, really sharp teeth, just like you saw on our skull a second ago. And they have really big and strong paws with super sharp claws, as well as a beautiful white coat. They can grow anywhere from six to nine feet tall. So if they were to stand on their back legs, they could grow six to nine feet tall, which both of those numbers are a lot taller than I am. And they can weigh 300 to 1300 pounds. That is a really big bear. Awesome. So our next question, where do penguins live? So where do you think this little guy might live? Do you think it's the Arctic, the Antarctic, or both? Well, if you guess the Antarctic, you are correct. Penguins only inhabit the southern hemisphere of our Earth, so below the equator. 
So that center line that runs through our earth below it. So there are seven species that live in Antarctica of penguins, including the Adele, the Chinstrap, the Gentoo, the King, the Macaroni, the Rockhopper, and the Emperor Penguin. However, out of these seven species, only three of them live on Antarctica for part of the year. And then the other four will actually spend their entire lives braving the cold on this continent. So not all penguins live there full time. Some of them just go there whenever it's a little bit warmer in the summer. So penguins are flightless birds, but they are excellent swimmers. So they basically fly through the water. Species are species like the Gentoo penguin, which is the fastest penguin in the world, are able to swim up to 22 miles an hour. Some of their favorite foods include krill, shrimp, squid, and fish. And they can dive for 20 to 30 minutes and they can also dive really, really deep. So 23 to 210 feet, depending on the species. Now that 210 feet down below the water is taller than Cinderella's castle at Disney World. Her castle's only 189 feet tall. So that's a really, really deep dive into the water to look for some food. Now I could talk about penguins all day, but let's move on to our next critter. So where do you think that orcas live? Yeah, orcas, killer whales. Where do you think that they live? Antarctic, Arctic, both? Well, if you guess both, you are correct. So orcas can live all over the world, including the Arctic and the Antarctic. They are a migratory species. And if you don't know what that big word means, migratory means that they move depending on food, seasons, they have a lot of different reasons that different animals will migrate, but usually it's dependent on seasons. And these guys will move long, long distances from one place to another. So if you've ever looked in the sky and saw the geese flying in a V shape south, um, they are more migrating south for the winter to stay warm. Orcas do the same thing. So they will travel to the Arctic or the Antarctic during the summer months to look for food and things like that in those areas, but they do not stay in one place all year round. They are a huge marine mammal. They can grow anywhere from 23 to 32 feet long. They also can weigh up to 12,000 pounds. They usually are very, very smart and curious creatures, but they're also fierce predators and they love to eat prey items like seals, fish, and even sharks. So I have another animal for you to guess on. We have the snowy owl. Where do you think that snowy owls live? They have this beautiful white plumage of feathers. A lot of their body is white. They have very little brown. Where do you think these guys might live? Well, if you guess Arctic, you are also correct. So snowy owls, like most owls, love to fly around and hunt for food like mice, lemmings, other birds, and fish. They're really, really strong, fierce predators, and they're able to use their excellent eyesight to hunt. However, sometimes they are unable to see their prey due to thick snow or ice. So they also use their super strong hearing to listen for their next meal. These guys usually have partners for life, so they always have a friend or a buddy with them, and they are crepuscular. So if you don't know what that big word is, it's a big fancy term for they are most active during dawn and dusk. So when the sun is coming up and when the sun is coming down. So they're not, not they are not nocturnal, they're not diurnal, they are crepuscular. They're most active during sun up and sun down. Awesome. So next question, where do caribou live? So I have my friend the caribou here, and then we also have a really cool artifact. I have a caribou shed right here. So these guys, very similar to deer, will have these sheds. So where do we think caribou live? Arctic, Antarctic, what do we think? Um, 
So if you guess the Arctic, you are correct. But these guys look a lot like reindeer. What do you think that these guys are able to be called other than reindeer? They're caribou. So they're actually the exact same animal. And the caribou is actually the wild version of this animal. And then the reindeer is when these animals are in human care or they are domesticated. So in the wild, they're caribou. In the human care or in domestic care, they are reindeer. I could not get that out, I'm sorry. <laughs> these guys in the wild and even in domestication, we use their really, really large hooves. So similar to deer, they have these big hooves that they will take and they will dig under the snow to find food. They'll also be able to kind of crack into ice if they needed to. These guys are also a migratory species. So they travel more than 600 miles during migrations. So they have one of the largest migrations of a lot of different animals. The woodland caribou is listed as an endangered species, but most of the other caribou populations are pretty stable, especially in these kind of Arctic areas. All right, so our next animal, the mighty musk ox, where do you think that he might live? So do you think they live in the Arctic, the Antarctic, or both? And I'll give you a hint. If you know what the white animal in front of them is, and you think about that name, then you might know where they live. So if you guess the Arctic, you are correct. And my hint was the Arctic wolf is what is right in front of them. So the musk, musk ox can weigh around 500 to 700 pounds. These guys are usually about four to five feet tall at the shoulder. And they are herbivores that travel in large herds, just like in that picture that you saw. And if you notice the stance that they were in, it was kind of weird. Um, they had their bottoms all backed up to one another. They almost looked like they were in a circle. This is actually a really common defense mechanism for the musk ox because they have these really, really large predators and they are herbivores and they don't have a whole lot of defense um, as an individual. So what they will do is they'll line their bottoms up to each other and make a circle and they'll stick their horns out on the outside of the circle and it makes them look bigger. Most predators aren't going to be able to target one individual out of an entire herd whenever they're so close together. So they're able to kind of fin off any predators that might be coming after them in that defense mechanism. They are called the musk ox because of their musky odor. And they really actually do pre look pretty similar to ox that are found in more southern regions of the world as well. So that is why they're called the musk ox. My next animal is an animal that a lot of people think are mythical creatures, but they are in fact real. Where do narwhals live? So narwhals are these, like I said, a lot of people think that they're the unicorns of the sea um, and that they don't exist, but they do. And they live in the Arctic and they don't really migrate far from where they are at. They're not really a migratory species. They'll travel a little bit, but they don't really go too far. So you saw their big tusk and it's usually on the males and it's actually an enlarged tooth with over 10 million nerve endings inside. So if you guys can touch your fingers like this or take your finger and kind of trace along your palm, you feel how it kind of tickles. Well, that is your nerves telling your brain that something is touching your hand. So these guys have nerves on their tusk that they're able to sense different things in the water or they're able to sense touch on that tooth or that tusk as well. Some narwhals can also have two tusks while other have, others have no tusks. And some of them can grow up to 10 feet long, just the tusk, not even the whale that's attached. So these guys are a marine mammal and they like to feed on halibut, cod, squid, shrimp. And a really cool fact about them is that they actually change color as they age. So at the start of their life, when they're newborns, they are bluish gray. After that, they turn into kind of a blue black color as juveniles or teenagers. 
And then towards the um, adulthood stages of their life, they turn kind of this mixture of a gray. And then towards the very end of their life, really old narwhals are nearly white in color. Now, there are several other species that live in these areas, including the Art Antarctic blue whale, seals, Arctic wolves, and sea lions. So I could talk all day about the animals that live in the Arctic and the Antarctic, because there's just so many cool species, but we've got to get moving on to the next thing. So with all of these creatures that we've talked about, how do they survive the harsh conditions in the cold? Well, I would take a guess and say that they use their adaptations. But what's an adaptation? An adaptation is something that an animal has on their body that they can use to help them survive. So it could be on their body, could be a way that they act, but something they have that helps them survive. So let's talk about some adaptations that the animals of the Arctic could have. Let's also look at some pictures of the animals in our exhibits here at Wonders of Wildlife to give us some clues. So if we look on the left part of this slide, we see some caribou and they're in the water, but you can see some really neat features on these guys. What I start out to notice is that thick fur and that has to act as some kind of help or adaptation to keep them warm, right? So they have that really thick fur that keeps them warm in the cold conditions. We also have the walrus over to the right. And these guys are not covered in hair. So maybe what helps keep them warm? Well, we know for sure that they have a thick layer of fat. It's called blubber. And we also know that they're a mammal, so they have to have some kind of hair or fur. But it's not very obvious, like the caribou. So another way that they help keep themselves warm is because the areas don't get sunlight very often, they have this dark coloring that will help them absorb sunlight and bring in heat. So it's kind of like if you wear a black t-shirt on a really, really hot day, you're gonna get warmer faster than if you were wearing like a lighter colored t-shirt. So the same thing goes for those guys. The next slide shows the musk ox again on the left in that formation. And these guys have definitely thick fur and a lot of fat to insulate. And then we have the polar bear. We talked about how they're the top predator of the, of the Arctic. And they have this white coloring to camouflage. So to camouflage, what is that? Well, that helps them blend in, right? A lot of the things in the Arctic and the Antarctic are white. So a lot of animals will be white. So the polar bear blends into the Arctic environment with his fur color. He also has really, really big feet to help him grip onto the ice. And I actually have an example of a polar bear foot right here. And they have this really, really big foot to help them kind of walk across the ice, travel these really far distances, and keep grip or traction on the ice. Last thing that they have is a greasy coat and it actually helps them repel water. So if you've ever tried to mix oil and water, we know that they don't really mix together. They kind of repel one another. They don't really like to mix with one another. So polar bears have a greasy coat. So after they're done swimming, the water just kind of drips off of them and they don't get too cold with that water. Penguins also have this as well. Their feathers are specialized and have that kind of hydrophobic or water repelling um, ability as well. Awesome. So now that we've looked at the conditions of the Arctic and the Antarctic, the animals that live there, the people of these areas, let's take a break and do a fun little craft like Haley mentioned at the beginning. So I'm gonna show you my materials and we'll kind of walk you through it I'm not gonna do it just cause I don't have a sink right here nearby to wash my hand of the paint, but I will walk you through what we're doing and then I'll let you work on it as I talk um, a little bit more and I'll kind of ease up on the question so you can focus on your craft and listen, okay? So I have a Christmas ornament of a caribou or a reindeer. So you are going to make it with your hand print. So what you're gonna do so you're gonna take your white piece of paper and your red piece of paper. And then you should also have some brown paint. You could also maybe use a marker 
and just kind of trace on the outside of your hand and color it in if you don't want to cover your hand in paint because sometimes that can be a little messy. Um, you'll also need three other colors of marker. You'll need a yellow or a brown, black and red if you would like your reindeer to have a red nose like our good friend Rudolph. We have a glue stick, a hole punch and some scissors. And the last thing you will need is some string so that you can hold up your ornament and hang it on your Christmas tree. Or if you don't have a Christmas tree, you could hang it kind of around your house just as a fun decoration that you have made after you learn some really cool facts. So to do this, like I said, you'll either need to paint your hand or you can draw the outline of your hand on your piece of paper and then color it in. That way you have your handprint on your paper. Then what you're gonna wanna do is cut it out. So cut out the outline and you're gonna want to glue it to your red piece of paper. So once you have cut it out, we're gonna simulate that this half piece of paper is your cut out piece. You're gonna glue it onto your red sheet and then just cut out a little bit of trim so that you have a little outline of color. You don't have to use red. You could also use whatever color you desire, or you don't have to have a background piece at all. I thought it just made it look a little bit more festive. So once you glue those two pieces together, then you'll want to add um, your, and you've put your handprint on it, you want to add their hooves. Remember those strong, strong hooves. You'll want a nose so that they can smell. Of course, their antlers. Um, just like we saw, and then their eyes so that they can see really, really well. You're gonna hole punch it and then put a string on it. So I know I went through that really fast. So just to double, double check and go over everything, you put your handprint on the white piece of paper, then you glue, cut it out, and then you glue it onto your other colored piece of paper, cut it out with your trim, then add in your final details like the hooves, the nose, the eyes, and the antlers. Then you hole punch and you would tie your string to it and you get your fun ornament just like mine. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and let you work on that. And while you finish up that craft, you can listen along as we do move on and you will still have plenty of time to work. I have quite a bit more material that we can look at. So before the craft, you got to see some really, really cool pictures of our amazing wildlife galleries here at Wonders of Wildlife. I wanted to also share with you a fun little video and some information about one of our residents who call Antarctica home. Can you guess who our friends might be? All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look. So these guys are our Gen 2 penguins. And I know that you might have seen our course in the past that talked about penguins, but I also wanted to share some more information about the penguins specifically here at Wonders of Wildlife. So Jintu penguins are the fastest swimming penguins in the world. They can swim up to 22 miles per hour and can dive really, really far. They can also hold their breath for seven to eight minutes long. Here at WOW, we have about 15 penguins. We have nine males and six females. They each have names and bands on their arms that help our keepers and our vet staff identify each bird. The females have bands on their left wing, left wing, and the males have bands on their right wing. Our exhibit is kept at a toasty 40 to 45 degrees. And the water can usually be between 28 and 32 degrees. Now you may say, hey, Audrey, 32 degrees is freezing. How is that water not frozen? Well, it doesn't freeze because it is salt water, not fresh water. So fresh water freezes at 32 degrees. And it also has a current that runs through it. So you can kind of see the water moving even when the penguins aren't swimming around. So it is not freezing, um, even though it is very, very cold. Also, our penguins build nests just like they would in the wild. And some of our penguins even have pairs in our um, exhibit. So what happens is these penguins have a really, really special ritual for finding a partner. 
they find the best, coolest, most favorite rock that they can find. And they say, this is the rock that I found. I want you to have it. And they give it to whatever other penguin that they want to be their partner. They say, I want you to have this. Now, if they accept the rock that is being given to them, then the two partners will go out and build a nest that is full of rocks just like these, and they'll build a little nest, and that is where they hang out um, and are able to be partners together. So if you were wondering, this is what a penguin egg looks like. Um, this is a replica. This is not real. But in terms of size, this is what it looks like. And these guys, um, we here at Wonders of Wildlife, we really don't have babies or eggs, but they do follow a lot of the natural patterns of our penguins that we see in the wild. So our penguins are fed three to four times a day, depending on the day. And they're usually fed in the morning, the afternoon, in the evening. They're fed very, very small fish like herring, silversides, capelin, and they're also supplemented with vitamins to help them stay healthy. So in this exhibit, you can also see that there are, to have um, a kind of weird environment over there, right? So you see all the pebbles and rocks, we put those in there so that they can um, carry out those partner finding rituals and then you see that little dome in the back that is where you can actually pop up inside and get a really close face-to-face -face look with those penguins there's also a big tunnel really close to the camera right under that pool of water that goes down into one of our restaurants that you can actually see the penguins swimming around as they're diving really really deep i'd say it's at least over seven eight feet um, i'd say it's probably even more than that so they are able to dive, even though they live here at Wonders of Wildlife in awesome, um, in our awesome facility. Awesome. So I hope that you enjoyed this footage and information. And if we could look at penguin footage all day long, I would love to, but we do have some other things to look at, even though these guys are definitely one of my favorite things to see here at our facility. So I'm glad I could share that with you. Since we are in the thick of the holiday season and Christmas and all of the other holidays are not too far away, I wanted to talk a little bit about how some of the animals we talked about earlier are celebrated during this time of year. So let's brainstorm and think of some of the animals that we think of during the holiday season. Now, one of the animals from earlier that we looked at, I think that I can draw a connection. So there's this movie called Elf, and this guy kind of comes across a really kind narwhal and wishes this guy, Buddy the Elf, luck on his adventure. You guys know which one I'm talking about? I hope so. Can you think of any more examples of where some of these animals might be in the um, kind of holiday traditions? Awesome, so I'm seeing the polar bear is a popular animal around Christmas time. Yeah, definitely. Ooh, penguins as well, yeah. You do definitely see those celebrated as well. I think more for the fact that it's really, really cold where they live as well. And it might be really, really cold where you're living right now as well as winter's kind of gearing up. Ooh, reindeer, yeah, that's the answer that I was looking for. And what was another name for reindeer again? Yes, caribou. So I would say that caribou or reindeer take the crown for being the most celebrated during this time of year. And I just kind of wanted to touch on some of the animals that we think of during this really awesome holiday season and some of the animals that we've learned a little bit about today. Oh my goodness, we have covered a lot of information today, but there is one more thing that I wanted to bring up before we move into our photo and Q&A. It's the challenges that these areas are facing. Unfortunately, climate change is showing large effects on the physical and living environments in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. The temperatures are rising and therefore we're seeing more frozen structures melting. 
So remember those big floating pieces of ice that we were talking about? Some of those are melting away because of the rise in temperatures. We're also noticing some declines in some of the animals that live in these areas. Some of the fan favorites, like the polar bear, are losing those big sheets of ice, which is a primary spot for them to hunt seals. This is also leading them to have to travel farther for food. And obviously they're getting really, really hungry as they're waiting for their next meal. And sometimes it can affect their ability to find food. Scientists have also noticed a decline in the body condition as well as the weight um, in these polar bears and a couple other indica indicators that polar bears may not be doing so well in their natural habitat. We also see that animals like krill and penguins are projected to decline a little bit as well. Penguins are among many animals that eat krill and with rising temperatures, other animals are able to move into the areas that penguins normally inhabit because they're just not as cold as they used to be. And they're now taking the krill um, or the food that they once ate. We will see a decline in krill populations, which in turn will cause a decline possibly in penguin populations as well. Now, I don't tell you this information to scare you or make you upset. I tell you this information because I think that it's really, really important for you to stay informed and aware of the wild, awesome world around you. And if you can, to help. Simple things like shorter showers, recycling, or walking instead of driving are just a few things that you can do to reduce that carbon footprint or just your footprint on the earth in general. There are also many conservation organizations that are working on reviving some of the populations of our Arctic and Antarctic fronts. So on a happier note, did you finish your craft? Because I think now would be a great time for a photo. So I'm gonna grab a couple of our friends. I'm thinking maybe our friend the caribou and maybe the penguin. And actually, let's go ahead and I'll hold my ornament up as well. We'll have the caribou and my ornament. If you wanna grab your ornament as well, I'll go ahead and pose for a picture so we can get an awesome picture together. with our crafts. And I'll throw a penguin in here too, what do we think? There we go. <laughs> Turn the caribou. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Audrey and everyone. Don't forget to post those selfies on Instagram and tag us here at Varsity Tutors as well as Wonders of Wildlife to be entered to win that one month membership to the after school club of your choice. So whether you want to learn more about animals, both Arctic, Antarctic and beyond, or maybe take your learning a different direction, there is an after school club for you there. Oh my goodness, that is so cool. All right, we've got some really wonderful questions. Audrey, are you ready for them? I think that I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So we had lots and lots and lots of interest in our narwhal friends. So lots of questions about whether both the male and the female narwhals grow tusks and where the tusks come from and differences between them. And how do we tell that a narwhal is a narwhal in the first place if it doesn't have a tusk? So We'll take all of those great big questions and narrow them down. Do you have any other cool info to share with us about the narwhal? Yeah, so addressing some of those, um, as I mentioned earlier, those are actually a modified tooth. So it's gonna be a modified canine tooth and that is what their tusk is kind of made out of. And for the question of males versus females, sometimes females can have a tusk. Um, I wouldn't say that it's totally rare, but um, it really just kind of depends on the narwhal. Now determining what makes a narwhal a narwhal and how is it different from say a beluga whale or a orca or a blue whale or whatever. Um, I would say coloration is a big thing um, because remember they're born with that really, really light or sorry, that really, really dark coloring and they kind of get lighter as they age. Um, another indicator is they do kind of like to travel with one another. They are fairly solitary, but sometimes you'll see them 
um, with one another. So that would be another indicator. Um, other than that, I think I answered all of those. Is there any others that you noticed? I think you got them. Yeah. So a lot of a uh, lot of really cool information to learn about our apparently not so mystical narwhals. <laughs> now. We also had lots of interest in those adorable penguins. And in particular, we had students who were wondering, uh, do you ever have any baby penguins at your exhibit? No, um, unfortunately we leave the baby pink, we don't leave them, but all the um, baby penguins live in the wild. We don't have any that um, are hatched here. We don't have any that are brought to us. Um, we have our specific set of penguins and they do not, um, have any babies that come up. We don't really even have eggs that pop up. So um, they just kind of follow that ritual, which we find as a good indicator that these guys are um, still able to follow those natural processes. But unfortunately, no, I would love a baby penguin, but I'll just have to stick to my, my little penguin stuffed animal for now. Oh, well, he's a very, very cute baby penguin as well. <laughs> We um we had some uh with some students who found it very interesting that sometimes we have different animals that go by some of the same names. So we saw that kind of caribou versus reindeer going by the same name. Um, are there any other animals that you know of or that students should be aware of that they might know by different names but are ultimately the same animal? Absolutely. So um, I know a really really common one um, here in Missouri. We call a mountain lion a mountain lion. But a mountain lion can also be known as a cougar or a puma. Um, so that's one that's kind of, a lot of the difference is more regional, not necessarily like domestic versus wild, um, because it would be very scary to domesticate a wild um, mountain lion or a puma. But um, the difference is more regional. So kind of wherever your area is at in the United States is what you would call that animal. Um, so that's one example that I can think of. Very, very cool. Like birds have different names as well. Um, so like the great horned owl has several different names. Um, those are their common names is how they're referred to in the scientific community. So all animals are categorized and they have a common name, which is what most people call them. And then they have that Latin name. So you can always see if it's actually the same animal by comparing the Latin name. If you don't know the Latin name, you can kind of compare those common names and see which animal that you're actually looking at. Awesome. Now, we, uh, we saw some of those adaptations and we saw the fact that quite a few of our snow and winter dwelling animals tended to be white in color. I know you mentioned a little bit why some of those animals are white in color, but we had some students wondering, you know, polar bears don't seem like they have very many predators. Why would they be white in color? And alternatively, why were some of our other animals not white in color? Yeah, so um, why polar bears are white, like you said, they don't really have a whole lot of predators, but they are a predator. So if they're trying to sneak up on some seals, they're trying to ambush, um, just think like an owl, they also have camouflage to the trees so that they don't get eaten by other owls, but also so that they can hide from the animals that they might want to find as predator or as prey items. So the polar bear is camouflaged to hide itself from its prey. And the prey items are colored a little bit darker. Um, like we mentioned earlier with the walrus, it could be to help kind of bring in the heat and help them conserve heat. You also have to think a lot of the animals that are darker um, also like to spend a lot of time in the water and the water is gonna be a lot darker than the white sheets of ice or snow. So that may help them blend into the water environment a little bit more than the kind of ice sheets. Awesome, and it is a, it is getting to be about that time. We've got lots more really wonderful questions, but we'll go ahead and end off with a question that we have had from a lot of our students who can see that you have the opportunity to get to learn more about and be involved with these animals all the time. So how do students who are interested in animals, interested in learning more, or maybe even interested in working with animals or animal education, what steps can they be taking to get a little closer to doing the sorts of things that you get to do? 
Absolutely. Um, so I, when I was your guys' age, I was always researching. I love to look through like the zoo books, um, little magazines. I love to read books. I love to read websites about animals and be able to just absorb information constantly. So throughout your entire life, you're going to learn and learn and learn, but you can learn about things you're tr really, truly interested in. That's a really, really great thing. And here at Wonders of Wildlife, I love that because I get to do it every single day. Um, if you want to join a career similar to this, I highly recommend, like I said, doing your research, reading a lot about the animals that you would be interested in either caring for or teaching about or whatever it may be and really just find kind of your area of animals that you would like. Um, a great way that we at Wonders of Wildlife have um, the ability to share animal information with you is we not only have these amazing varsity tutors live streams that we are so, so happy to be a part of, we also have a app called Mission Conservation and Agents of Discovery. So the app is Agents of Discovery, and it's basically a virtual scavenger hunt that you can play right at home. Or if you ever come to Wonders of Wildlife, you can play it here as well. And we are um, able to provide some really cool, awesome animal information that way as well. We also talk about the land and environments, conservation, all kinds of really cool stuff. So that's another great way that you could get involved in a career just like mine. Well, that is awesome. And thank you so much for kickstarting so much of that learning for our students, particularly about our Arctic and Antarctic creatures today. We thank you so much for joining and thank you to the entire team at Wonders of Wildlife. Thank you to, for everyone who tuned in for all of your wonderful questions. Uh, by all means, those of you who followed along with the craft, we would love to see those crafts in your selfies. If you didn't have the materials or didn't have the chance to follow along with us live, not to worry, we will have the recording up on our YouTube page at Varsity Tutors. So feel free to check it out and follow along with the recording to participate in the craft. In the meantime, we're going to have Wonders of Wildlife back at the start of the year to tell us more about some of some of the wonderful creatures under their care but we hope to see you back in another varsity tutor star course soon and again don't forget to post those selfies thanks everybody